Please be seated. And now hear the. And now hear the word of God from the Gospel of Matthew. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives up a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. So, there's a time and place for literalism, and sometimes it can create incredible clarity and other times confusion. That is the issue with it. Take, for example, a minister who was walking down the halls of his Sunday school classrooms, and he decided he'd just walk in on one of the classrooms. And when he was there, he saw the teacher teaching all the lovely children a wonderful lesson, and so he thought he would quiz them. So he asked, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And immediately, the little boy said, it wasn't me, sir. <laughs> And the minister was flabbergasted. And he looked at the teacher and he asked, is this how the children behave in your classroom? She said, I, I know Tommy and I really don't think that he did it. <laughs> so he left the classroom in a huff and he went to go find a church official. And he found one and he shared with the church official what he had just experienced in that classroom. And the church official said, well, I know the teacher and I know the young boy. I've known them for a long time and I really think they're telling the truth. I don't think that they did that. Well, his last resort was to go and scold the chairperson of the education committee. So he goes and finds this person. And he shares all that happened and she said, you know, really, I don't know why you're making such a big deal out of this. Find out how much it costs to repair the wall. <laughs> We'll write a check, and we'll take it from our buildings fund, and besides, insurance is probably going to reimburse us. <clears throat> Literalism. It did not create clarity in that. Well, it depends on whose eyes you were looking through, I suppose. But also sometimes in life, not only can we take stuff literally as it's presented to us, but also in order to create clarity or to make a point, we'll state the obvious. Now, Geico... Auto insurance has made a marketing bonanza off of this, have they not? Can Geico lower your auto insurance? Does Abraham Lincoln always tell the truth? And then you see the scene of this grainy film, and Mary Todd has got this dress on, and she asks Mr. Lincoln in his tall hat and his black coat, does this dress make my butt look big? And then you see him start to contort as he's cannot lie, but he has to tell the truth, and, he, and then she storms out of the room. Of course it does. Of course he can. He cannot tell a lie. Well, it's amazing to me that next month I will have been preaching here for 19 years. I know. And in many ways it's been very rewarding, in some ways frustrating, because some of you have not changed a bit in all that time. <laughs> <laughs> Some of you, like me, are thinking, wow, that has gone by so quickly. And others are thinking, he's still here? <clears throat> but one thing that you know about me is I am not a biblical literalist. All right? You know that. I, in fact, I love all the gray. Because I think that sometimes it's in the gray that is the mystery, and you can find all kinds of different meanings to things. And I know from my brain that works wonderfully sometimes for yours, maybe not so much. But there are parts of the Bible I do take literally. And I call this selective literalism. God so loved the world. I take that one literally. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I take that one literally. God is with you forever and ever. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing in this world, not death, not disease, not the sword, not famine, nothing can separate you from the love of God. I take that one literally. But for the most part, 
I kind of look at the Bible as, well, if we can look to see what it means between the letters and between the lines, ah, that's where the great mystery is. But then you have a verse like we have today, which seems to me that makes the point very, very clearly of who we are and what we're to be about. I heard recently that the Supreme Court ruled on whether or not law enforcement can take a look at your cell phone without a search warrant. And so the ruling was, and it's very clear, there's no, you don't need a lawyer or a team of people to try to debate and find a loophole in this. If a police officer or law enforcement officer wants to take a look at your cell phone and all of its contents, then they have to get a search warrant. That's just clear. I see that this passage is very clear for you and for me. Jesus says, now that I've trained you to be my disciples, I'm sending you out to be my messengers. And those who receive you, not only receive you, but they also receive me and the one who sent me, which is God. And that is who, by the way, tore down the walls of Jericho, just in case some of you were. Some of you may have missed everything I've said so far because you're still wondering, now who did that? Who tore that? But he's not only saying this to teach his disciples about what it is to go out and to represent Jesus and his message and his deeds in the world around them, but it's also a message for those who receive it. For whenever you receive one of these messengers, he says, you receive me and you receive God. So it's both and. And then he says, and for those who are my prophetic voice in the world, you will receive your reward. Another translation of that great Greek word is wages due. Now, what is the reward? Many religions and I include all religions, even the one that I grew up with, portrays God as this super mega certified public accountant. And you can see God sitting at God's desk with that banker's lamp, you know, that green lampshade. God's got God's visor on, shirt sleeves rolled up, long beard because he doesn't have time to shave <clears throat> and the super super bifocals because well there's a lot of reading doing God's at God's terminal and has every name of every person on this planet and there's credits and there's debits and as you live your life God's watching everything you do and if you do something good there's a credit if you do something good, there's a debit hopefully God doesn't pound it too hard because it might make two and what we hope is and what we hope is that when we die and God tallies up the score, we got more credits than we do debits. Is that right? Does that sound familiar to many people? Now, what is that reward? Well, it depends on your tradition. It's a mansion, streets paved with gold, unlimited Italian buffet or seafood buffet, all the food. For some, it's 72 virgins. I've never understood why 72. But I suppose that if that's your belief, then you need to have a really large mansion to house all your 72 virgins and their own spaces for them to decorate. Now, to show you how old I am, just turned 57, and the 72 virgin thing doesn't interest me, but if I could have a mansion with a golden driveway, with a Ferrari and a McLaren and a Lamborghini. Ah, that would be the life for me. What is the reward? Many of us go about our religious lives, which hopefully evolve into spiritual lives, thinking, here are the rules. If I obey the rules, I get the rewards when I die. And for me, that seems severely lacking. Like Denise Harbin. She died on June the 13th, and she says, is this all there is? <clears throat> no, she's very much alive. <laughs> God's a good speller, yes, thank you. 
I think there's much more to that. And sometimes it's hard to really see, now this is where it gets a little bit nebulous and gray, what the reward could be, especially when you're in the middle of stuff. One of my favorite authors wrote a life-changing book for me, and I've spoke of him many times, and recommended his book to you and to many people, Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl. As Nazi Germany was invading Austria, and taking over, he had the opportunity to leave and come to the United States. And he was really torn by this. Why? Because, well, his parents lived close by. His wife and his family were here and were there in Austria. What was he going to do? What was he going to do? So he asked God to give him a sign. Have any of you ever done that? Have God ever given you the sign and you ignored it and looked for another one? <clears throat> and a few days after he prayed this prayer, his father came to him with a piece of marble from the synagogue that had just been bombed. And when Viktor Frankl looked at it, it had a Hebrew writing on it that he recognized immediately, and it came from the Ten Commandments, and it said, Honor your father and your mother. And that was it. He chose to stay. Well, his parents... He and his wife and kid were all taken to Auschwitz. His parents died. His family died. Where is the reward in that? Seriously. And he suffered terribly. But if he had come to the United States, he would not have been in that camp. He would not have observed human behavior. He would not have experienced the little things that people would do to share a piece of bread when they had... He would not have seen or experienced any of that, and he would have never written the book, Man's Search for Meaning, which has inspired millions of people. Millions of people. Sometimes it's hard to see whenever we're doing our discipleship and we're being the people God created us to be where the reward is. Because quite frankly, I would rather be driving the Ferrari through the Austrian Alps than living in Auschwitz, right? Okay. So where's the reward? Why should we do this? If, if it's not going to be a mansion with 72 versions and, and, and every kind of Ferrari ever made, then why should we do this, right? In 2010, for our honeymoon, Amy and I went to Italy. And we spent a day in Florence. And one of the many churches we visited there was the Church of the Cross. And the reason they call it the Church of the Cross because they had this like three-story Byzantine cross with the image of Jesus on it. All right, Byzantine is really, really big over there. There's a lot of it. And like most of the great cathedrals in Europe, they're over the altar table. It's like 10 stories straight up, and there's a dome ceiling, and it's all over the altar. And this particular church was not only known to have this Byzantine cross hanging over the altar area, but also the amazing fresco that was created behind it. Well, when we were in the church, unfortunately... You could see at the altar area there was scaffolding with floor to ceiling, and it was covered with that kind of opaque plastic. You knew something was behind it, but you couldn't really see. And so we walked around the church, and we found an open door. And Amy and I looked at each other. It's not closed. What's the worst that could happen? They throw us out of the church? So we walked in, being very quiet, looked around, and we saw this beautiful display cabinet. And there in one corner of it was folded this, this alb or this robe that was made of this very loosely woven fabric. It's more like a, 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 a barley sack, right? Not something, it's not, it was not Egyptian cotton. You could just tell that it was a scratchy kind of fabric. And next to it, it said, the robe or the alb of St. Francis Assisi. Well, Amy grew up Catholic. And she, you know, learned about all the saints. And that's her favorite one. That's her favorite saint. And her father is a veterinarian, and St. Francis Assisi is the patron saint of veterinarians. So for her to see this was just like, ah. 
And then the priest walked in. He must have seen all the shock upon our face and the fear in our eyes. No, 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 no. Is it okay for us to be? He did not speak English. It's fine. Okay, okay. So I pointed at the all, and I then tugged on his shirt sleeve. I said, St. Francis Assisi, really? Oh, yes, 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 see, see, see. Grazie, padre, grazie, grazie. And we, we wove our way on around. Now, these grand cathedrals, they all have within them not only the main worship area, but these little niches that families would sponsor to put great works of art in their tombs and so forth, but also other little chapels. And so we're walking around, our feet are hurting so badly. We're tired, and we find this little chapel, and we sit and we rest, and there is this incredible mosaic of just all the colors you can imagine. And it's just glorious. So, yes, we're resting, but we're also sitting for a very long time admiring the artwork, and the priest comes walking up. Well, Amy, growing up Catholic, has a guilty conscience anyway. <laughs> and we both look at each other thinking, okay, now they're going to toss us out. And it's the priest. And he went to us and went, oh, jeez. <laughs> we follow him. And he takes us, and he unlocks this door, and he takes us inside. So, oh, this must be where the, like, the big guy really lives and works. And he takes us into this chapel that Michelangelo had created. This was not open to tourists. And it had on the altar area these two incredible sculptures that he had done, carved out of marble. The ceiling was painted, and it was a glorious, you know, scene of the sun bursting in angels. It was pristine. It looked like it was just created yesterday. And somehow he was able to convey to us that this is a very, very special place that only dignitaries and their families do weddings, baptisms, and special services. So this priest invited us to this wonderful private jewel and allowed us to see it. Grazie, grazie, Padre, grazie, grazie. We're so thankful. Oh, thank God. Can you believe this is happening to us? Grazie, grazie. And we walk outside, and we're getting ready to carry on, and he said, no, no, no. I said, what? He said, you know that scaffolding that I was talking to you about and all that plastic over it? He took us behind the plastic. And up we go, all the stories. And a fresco that was created in the 1300s is being reconditioned, cleaned. And you see all of the technicians with tiny little brushes and chemicals just getting all the soot and the dirt and stuff from centuries of worship off of it. And there we are, three feet away from this. Not only do we get to see this, but we get to see the cross. They're redoing the gilding, and they're repairing it and refurbishing it as well. There we are, stuff that was created a long time ago. You know I'm terrible at math, so I'm not going to do the subtraction. It was created a long, long time ago, and there we are, us, the priests, and the technicians who were cleaning it. Can you believe this, Amy? I know, this is incredible. Finally, we're leaving. We're overwhelmed with gratitude. And then I, being an American tourist, reach into my pocket and start pulling out some euros. The priest was appalled. No, 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 no money, no, no, no. But for the church, we're grateful. Well, fortunately, someone who worked in the church who could speak English came up, and we tried to convey to her, and the priest said, no, no, no. So we said, well, what is the priest's name? She says, his name is Father Eugene. Okay. Father Eugene, we're very, very thankful. We want to make a contribution to your church for all your kindness. No. No money. And he said this in English. No money. Be obedient to God. And even as I share this story with you now, I'm right there in front of him. Just everything in me started to melt. What is the reward for doing something as kind and simple and profound as giving a cold glass of water to somebody who is thirsty? What is the reward for being obedient to your mother and your father and living through Auschwitz? What is the reward for 
being a disciplined person to live a spiritual life, to seek God, to know God, to understand God, and to grow and to evolve into a spiritual being. What is the reward? Being obedient. Being obedient. For there's nothing in this world that can match it. Thus ends the lesson. Let us pray.